Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. I welcome you all here this morning uh, on this wonderful uh, Sunday morning. For announcements, the uh, first announcement I wanted to share, I kind of heard some misunderstanding, but uh, next Sunday we will still have three services. The combined service does not start till June 9th. There's five Sundays in June, so it's confusing. Uh, but June 9th is when we will have one at 9.30. So next Sunday is still 8, 9, and 11, and then the following Sunday is when it will start. So I'll remind you again next week, uh, just so that you are reminded of that. Um, also, there are a few things come up, quite a few things here in June. Um, the Midwest Mission is filling the truck and annual conference. Uh, so Missions and Hospitality is asking for your help in sending bedding kits. The bedding kits consist of one twin bed flap sheet, one twin bed fitted sheet, one pillowcase, and one pillow, and they are put in unscented 13-gallon uh, trash bags. Or you can just bring them here to the church, and they will be put in uh, bags here. Um, and then have those here by June 5th. Uh, I will take those down when I go on June 5th. Also on June 6th at 7.30 is our hymn festival here. Uh, congregation plays an active role singing along with several of the hymns. There's a festival choir of around, around 30 Muscatine area singers. Uh, and they will also join in singing uh, three different anthems with some reflections. So it sounds like a great time of singing together as one community. Also a reminder that Vacation Bible School and Summer Music Camp there's information about that in your bulletin for registration for those, or if you would like to volunteer, I'm sure they would love to have you volunteer in uh, whatever area that you feel uh, you are able to do, and uh, will be much appreciated for that. Um, also, today is the uh, Chamber Choir's last time singing this program here, so we want to thank them for their wonderful music uh, that they share each time uh, as they get a nice break for the summer to, to recuperate and refresh for the coming fall season. So. Uh, other announcements? What about joys or concerns this morning? We want to lift up to the Lord. Well, if you would please stand then and join together as we prepare our hearts and singing, O oh Lord, hear my prayer.
thanks to the Lord as we offer up our gifts of praise and thanksgiving.
The God of roaring thunders, the Lord upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Then one of the winged creatures flew to me, holding a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed, and your sin is removed. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom should I send, and who will go for us? I said, I'm here. Send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word that breathes life into us, that guides us and convicts us. And we ask that the words that are heard this morning also be your words for your people. Amen. One of the requirements to be an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church is what they call CPE clinical pastoral education. And it's similar to clinicals that like a, a nurse would have, you're assigned a floor, you go in and you visit uh, patients in their room. Uh, but one of the differences in it is that you also have a supervisor and a group of peers in which you bring back to them what is called verbatims, which is a word-for-word -word conversation that you had with someone you were visiting. And during this time frame, they dissect basically the entire conversation to figure out uh, what did you do or why did you say what you said during this visit. And the whole point of CPE is one, to learn about how to care spiritually for others, but also it is a lot of self-reflection. Some of it seeking more therapeutic and counseling when you're with supervisors and your peers because through the process, the point is to dig up things from maybe your past or currently in your life that is uh, impacting how you respond and care for others. 
And I'm reminded of that specifically when I read this passage here in Isaiah because Isaiah has to go through a moment of purification where he is then healed to before he can make the commitment to serve the calling that God has called him to. In order to be fully himself, to have the ability to do what God is calling him to requires full healing, even painful healing, such as a coal touching his lips right hot from the fire. But also Isaiah's passage uh, reminds us of the holiness and goodness of God, driving us in, into this beautiful scene in which Isaiah gets to witness God on the throne and the angels singing wonderful uh, words as they proclaim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. So loud, in fact, that it says it shakes everything around them because of their voices singing and praising how holy and great God is. An acknowledgement of God's purity and goodness. Isaiah is privy to this, but Isaiah responds a little differently than what we are given in verse 1. Now, verse 1 might seem like it's not important. It says, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died. It seems like just the fact that he died. But if we look at the history of what took place before King Uzziah died, uh, in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, you learn that King Uzziah was a good king. He followed the laws uh, and he led the people well until towards the end of his life where he became uh, so powerful and, and he let it get to his head. He became arrogant about it. And he went into the temple of the Lord and went into the Holy of Holies, lighting a candle there to do the, the incense and the prayers, which he was not allowed as a king to do. In fact, the only ones who would enter into the temple of the Lord would be a priest. And the priest tried to stop him. They tried to tell King Uzziah, don't do this. Don't, don't do this act against the laws of the Lord. And King Uzziah, feeling so powerful and great, does this and instantly is cursed with a skin disease. A skin disease which will then be with him the rest of his life until he dies. But also because of that skin disease, he will be no longer allowed even to enter into the temple People with uh, different illnesses and diseases were considered unclean. They could not enter into the temple of God, basically excommunicated from the temple area or anyone who was going into it because they did not want to become unclean. This was his punishment for feeling as though he was so important to take on the role that God had given to the priest to do. And King Uzziah's death then it was also a momentum moment for the Israelite people because it was soon after this that a lot of the kings were not good. They did not follow the laws of God and the Israelite people will eventually be separated and put into slavery in different nations and be uh, spread apart. And that is the context then of which Isaiah's call story comes into in this chapter 6. Six chapters, of course, after Isaiah starts does he tell this amazing and wonderful event. But it's important to know that he is encountering the holy and holy of God, the most pure and wonderful God. And Isaiah's response, differently than King Uzziah's, is one of humility. Woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. I am unworthy to even be in the presence of God in this moment. His humility is a response of the greatness of God. The, when we look at Isaiah chapter 6, it connects us to really how a service of worshiping to, to God should look like. You begin with adoration, going in to the Holy of Holies, worshiping a God who is holy and great, and then at the same time, knowing your unworthiness of God's greatness and love and our human failures filled with sins. That we are not perfect and holy. We actually can't even comprehend the holiness of God here on earth. We, we often hear of God's goodness and God's love and grace, which is wonderful, and that is about God, but God is also holy. Meaning that God is so pure and holy that God's love, uh, we can't 
uh, fully know here on earth because every love that we have or we encounter is fractured. You can love someone completely with the most that you possibly could and yet at the same time, in return, might be hurt by that person you love. Or you might hurt the person you love because we live in a sinful and broken world where our, our mouths sometimes speak before our hearts or minds think about it. Or we live in a hurtful world because we do actions that maybe we meant well, but unintentionally they harmed one another. We can't even fully grasp the holiness of God's love because it is a love so pure and so beautiful that we can't experience it here. We can experience beautiful glimpses of it and beautiful examples of Christ's love through scripture, through encounters with one another, but not the greatest holiness that Isaiah is experiencing in that moment. And Isaiah then does what is next in the act of worship. He humbly admits that he is unworthy, that he lives among people with unclean lips, that he himself has unclean lips. And he lays it all out. And instantly, it says that an angel of the Lord goes and gets a hot coal from the fire and places it on his mouth. We don't hear his response, but I imagine it was painful. It probably screaming in pain because of that hot flame on his lips. But there's a purification necessary for him to be holy, as Christ and God is holy was one that was painful, one that meant purging of all that he had done, that the people of Israel had done, that things had been done upon him, the struggles and suffering and harm that he had endured in order for him to fully hear the call that God has for him. Tying it back into the story that at the beginning, in order to be able to fully care for someone else, one needs to be healed from the things going on in their life. So in order for Isaiah to be able to go out into the world to serve the Israelite people, he needed to be healed by God, to be pure and holy as Christ was pure and holy. And it was painful. But it was after this moment of humility, of acknowledging he was unworthy, that he is given healed wholeness and healed by God. And it's then that the next part happens in the worship. And that is the call. That God calls and said, who will go for us? Who, who can I send? And I made a response with, here I am, sent. But as I shared in the children's sermon, I don't imagine that that was near as exciting as we seem to be. We end, the lectionary ends it with verse 8. But if you continue reading into the rest of chapter 6, especially up to 13, it is not a great call. Actually, it's very painful. In fact, what God is asking Isaiah to do is to preach and prophesy to deaf ears, basically to preach that they be deaf and they not hear respond to God and, and continue preaching to them that their destruction will happen and that, it, that basically Israel will be destroyed. It ends on a small and hopeful note though, the end of verse 13, in which all that will be, remain is a stump and a seed, a seed of hope, that all is not lost, that they will be rebuilt again and God will gather all from the ends of the earth. But this calling to share this news, to lead the Israelites into complete destruction, does not sound like a joyful, exciting, here I am, call them. Here I am, Lord, send me. It seems the opposite of that. In fact, most of the uh, prophets in the Old Testament did not have joyful, exciting, happy calls. If you know most of the stories, even uh, the story of Jonah, he hears God call him, and he turns in the opposite direction, going away from where God calls him to go. You have Moses, when God is calling out from the burning bush, and God says, you know, I'm calling you to go in to help set my people free from slavery. Moses is like, I'm not the right one for that. I can't speak. So God sends Aaron to help him. Then you have the prophet Jeremiah, who says, I'm too young. How could you call someone so young? And continuing on and on through all of the different prophets in the Old Testament, many of them, their own stories, were times of great unbelief. How could you call me, or how can I go into what dangers might arise? Many of their stories 
were to preach devastation and destruction and suffering to the Israelites. So I don't imagine that Isaiah was very excited about it. I really like the way that the CEB translation that you read this morning puts a period and not an explanation mark. It's more as if, I guess, here I am. I I I'll follow you. I guess. If I have to, I must be the one that you're calling. I just experienced this amazing and wonderful uh, thing here. I guess I'll go and do what you say. But it takes healing first for Isaiah to get to that moment. It takes a, a moment of humility to be healed and forgiven and made whole in the, with God and to be able to hear that call and to respond. Because the, this calling for Isaiah is going to be hard and painful. And now that he's going to need to rely the most on the strength of God to hear God in the midst of the suffering going on himself and the Israelite people. Calling is a challenge at times. But all of us are called by God when we have been healed and made whole through the love of Christ. Then we have a calling in which God is with us in every moment. Every job that you have, God has called you there for a reason. And sometimes... There are days where it is not a pleasant moment. And you need to trust in God and pray to God to give you the strength to continue doing what God has called you to do in those moments. But other times, it might be joyful. It might be like, here I am, God. Send me. Let's do this. This is going to be a great day because I'm sharing your love with others. But other times, it might be a desert. Things have died. There's destruction, there's suffering, there's pain, and you're called to be in the midst of that. All of our callings come from a God who gives us and equips us with the strength to do what God calls us to do. But it begins first with adoration, confession, knowing that God is the most holy and we are not. But because of God's holiness and love, we are worthy. And we are strengthened to be able to journey ahead, whatever that journey is that God has, so that we might say, here I am, send me. I might not be feeling it right now, but I know that you're with me along the journey. Here I am, send me. Isaiah's call story is very similar to all of ours. I, I understand why the lectionary ends it on verse 8, because that sounds more cheerful, right? It ends with, God is calling you, you profess, yes, here I am, you call me God, and, and you go about doing what God has called you to, but if you keep reading, it means that even when things get tough, when the challenge is painful, when you want to give up, your statement is, I guess, God, you call me, so I will still trust in you for strength. To continue on in the midst of the destruction with a little bit of hope, that seed of hope that is all Isaiah had, during all of this, that God promises there will be a stump, and a stump with a seed, new life, that will grow through this. When we know that God is holy and pure, pure and beautiful, and when we uh, confess and lay it all down at Christ and become purified and made new, then we have God who strengthens us to send us out into the world to do what God has called us to do. And every time in your life, at no matter what age or generation it is, every person has a unique calling by God, and it can change. I know uh, uh, some of my clergy peers have heard some of their stories, and they are more stuck in career. They didn't become a pastor until later on in their life after they've had other careers. And if you talk to them about it, most of the time, They'll say, oh, I was called a long time ago. I just didn't listen. Right? It took years and years before they actually uh, listened to God's call and went ahead with it. And, and, and calls change like that. But God is continually uh, pouring upon our hearts when we confess and we feel and know that we are redeemed and loved through Christ. Then our life uh, following after Jesus is one of continual, here I am, Lord. Here I am, send me. I don't know what it'll look like, but I'm here, send me. Because I know your worthiness and love is so great that it's only through that that I am worthy and loved to. Let us pray. God, we know that there are times we struggle to know you because we shy away 
Our sin makes us unworthy, our guilt makes us feel we need to hide God or the pain that has been done to us makes it seem like that hope is so hard to find. And yet, you call us to your throne to see and to know you, God, as you are in the most purest and most beautiful love. A love that doesn't fade, a love that does not hurt us or abandon us. God, in this love, this love is what purifies and changes us so we can let it go, so that we can be healed and made whole and pure as you intended us to be. And then, God, you send us out, sending us out sometimes with reluctancy, with joy, with every emotion that we can grasp or hardly grasp, to follow after what you have for us, leading the way, God, strengthening us and guiding us to your everlasting joy and peace. And may we cling on to that strength when days are heavy and hard to know that there is a new seed growth, that your hope endures forever. Amen. Let us join together this morning as we stand in professing our faith and trust in God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. joy and love and peace and hope of God. Feel your hearts, feeling them, healing them, making you whole so that you may go sent out into the world to hear the call of Christ and may live it filled with strength for the days ahead.